Muy buenas noches y muchas gracias por acompañarnos a este encuentro, esta charla que pretende profundizar where we intend to uh, focus on the issue of slow fashion versus uh, haute couture. Well, uh, we can take our masks off. Now we're keeping the right distance. I need to apologize, first of all, because given the, the situation, this uh, health alert and this constant changing policy, our speakers cannot be here in person. Uh, Sibylle could not travel. And uh, Stefan Jansen, we're lucky from Milan and uh, from the screen. Hi, Stefan, how are you? Fine. Well, he's joining us. So Margarita Ruira, one of the promoters of the sustainable fashion concept, co-founder of the E Fascinante e Portal, uh, has been able to join us and be here with us to to tell us about the Black Swan, uh, the challenge of uh, contemporary fashion. And uh, even more so in these last six months where uh, there was uh, a shakeup all over the world and we felt this. The, uh, now fashion has, has actually become more and more naked. George Armani, in April, when, when he was still under lockdown, told me, because I asked him about the, the, the sense of uh, fashion and this uh, speed production chains, this accelerated chain, chains of production that have uh, managed to do away with uh, great talent. I remember Alexander McQueen in 2000 in Madrid. He came here to receive an award. And after dinner, you know, small talk and, you know, just uh, sharing some small secrets uh, beyond journalism, he, he actually admitted that he was under such pressure that he was, he didn't feel up to, to, to be able to keep up with the rhythm, with uh, audacity, with innovation, to be able to, to keep up with uh, these uh, need to, to have something new to tell. And, uh, well, we all know the dramatic ending that Alexander McQueen had. And we know what happened to all those designers who wanted to escape this rigid format of the fashion system. Uh, obviously not in such an unfortunate way as Alexander McQueen, but let's just uh, remember uh, John Galliano. And, uh, but Armani told me, if there is a problem with the fashion system, it's not doesn't have anything to do with where things are made because I've asked, asked him about uh, re, about um, um, uh, globalization and outsourcing and and uh, the the, the um, workshops in um, uh, Vietnam and other countries that are, have uh, now been out of of work and this has indeed in turn generated a crisis over there. He said, "Well, we need to to." Um, um, distance ourselves from uh, this paradigm of, 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 of rapid fashion, of fast fashion. We need, uh, they, uh, all brands have focused on fast fashion, but they have forgotten that luxury takes time to achieve uh, luxury, to obtain it, to enjoy it. It takes time. It, it doesn't make any sense that m one of my jackets only lasts for three weeks in a shop before becoming obsolete and being replaced by, different pro by a different product. I don't work that way. And I think it is actually immoral to do so. Well, in now evoking that um, and following on that idea, uh, I'd like to um, introduce to you Stefan. Jahan Jensen, when he was a child, he wanted to be a fashion designer. His grandmother told him, hide, hide to, to be happy. 
well now that he is well known. He's uh, uh, worked with the greatest uh, uh, Saint Laurent, Pierre Berger, almost adopted him. He, they made you uh, know everything, and they, they, they made you have a, a, a this uh, through their school and through their teachings, all this uh, wider world of fashion that uh, Saint Laurent as a master could uh, interpret so well. He has uh, also worked with Kenzo, with Diane von Forstenberg, who helped him understand uh, uh, women's bodies better. But three decades ago already, he was uh, a trailblazer. He decided to create his own line. He got away from from um, uh, the, the catwalks and the the diktats uh, the, the, of the fashion world. He, he, he wanted to forget about the term trend. And he found his own bubble, his own sense, his own meaning. In, in a small uh, bicycle repair shop in the Carlo Goldoni street in Milan, he set up shop there. And he started experimenting with uh, bespoke suits, with uh, suits that are exclusive and, and are born of slowness, of uh, being slow. So what was that experience for you? What do, did it mean to you? So you, you did not feel sufficiently appreciated that your work was not sufficiently appreciated in uh, the whole fashion system. Well, first of all, good evening, everyone, and I'm, I'm really sorry not to be there with you. But I'd like to say, and, and, and uh, apologies for my Spanish. No, it's wonderful. Your Spanish is wonderful. Thank you. Well, I was very lucky in my life because, you know, like you said, I, I met my hero, who was and still is Yves Saint Laurent, and uh, another one who is uh, Kenzo, one of the best designers in in uh, recent history. So these two major figures in the fashion world, uh, I met them, and uh, and I was so lucky. I was first uh, became friends with uh, Saint Laurent, and then with Kenzo. If, to me. You know, it was, you know, very painful to see what was happening. The price you have to pay in fashion, it was very painful, uh, you know, the what uh, Alexander McQueen had to endure and those words by Armani. It is a crazy world out there in the fashion world. I think that what's most important in in um, in life, it's 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 not a dress. I mean, a dress. I love dresses. I, I think they're beautiful. I live with them. But there are many many other things that are much more important. Now I have customers who come to see me, clients, and say, "Well, I don't need anything," and I tell them, "Well, of course, of course. I mean, we are so lucky. We don't need we don't need anything. I I, I know many people who actually." Need clothes uh, in the in the um, uh, little town I live uh, uh, close to Tangier. Uh, the people who actually need clothing, they are very modest and very proud people as well. But the price of success is too high in my in my view. Well, Margarita, you're also uh, a strong advocate for slow fashion. For you, fashion can only be conceived as a slow. Um, activity. You come from the financial world, from the from econ the economy world, and you were always passionate about f uh, about fashion. And uh, you you were one of the pioneers by creating this portal for for this uh, uh, slow fashion. Where all designers are welcome, I suppose. Yes, I think we've reached the time. I think it's a very um, timely moment where we've uh, spoken directly to the uh, fashion world, to uh, consumers in general, in, in, at a moment when uh, the country was very much ready to listen to this message of uh, actually consuming food, in a, uh, consuming fashion in a much more different uh, way. Uh, the, 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 in the last couple of years, and now with uh, the pandemic even more so, there are two key issues that have had a great bearing on this. It's uh, uh, sustainability and uh, um, 
uh, reusability, well, Stella McCartney had already been discussing this for four years at least, uh, constantly. Uh, sustainability, that's on the one hand. And there's the second uh, issue is the digitalization. So there are two um, questions that have been raised very recently in one of the uh, last uh, lectures that we've just heard. And uh, these two elements have uh, a key role now in fashion. And we need to manage those. The paradigm, there's been a paradigm shift. The way we consume things have changed, has changed, and the way we see the world um, is changing drastically. So now we start understanding how we dress, what we look for in a dress, how we uh, put order into a wardrobes, and uh, uh, how we do things. Well, this is on the table now, and uh, it needs to be dealt with. My daughter, Valentina, she had the chance once she finished her, her studies. Uh, she worked in for Stella McCartney and with Temperley, and she had the chance to work very directly with the digital world and with these uh, philosophies of uh, uh, the environment and sustainability. And when she came back, we realized that in uh, in our environment, the, the were, these were things that were not simply not uh, being discussed at all. Now uh, they are. Uh, Moda Madrid, its uh, motto this year was slow fashion, and that's you know something we're very happy about because now we are an increasing number of people uh, who believe in this. Uh, even small uh, fashion brands, uh, you, you know, people. People could not really mention any. Couldn't, I mean, we were all dressed in uh, fast fashion. We had one or two firms in the world, one or two major companies that actually solved all our needs. And that's it. I mean, you buy something, it's so cheap that if it's not a success, then you just forget it at the back of, your, uh, of a drawer, and that's it. So it's a good experience now that the Spanish society, uh, Spanish society has been able to experience this. Uh, the, the pandemic has allowed people to get them uh, to know themselves better, to to learn more about their own likes and dislikes, to create a new fashion culture. The times are changing, and I think that these environmental uh, um, questions and these uh, ethical issues raised by you know uh, child uh, poverty, child. Um, exploitation. Yes, and not only that, it's uh, one of the most uh, polluting industries in the world. It, ha it causes a great part of the uh, greenhouse gas emissions in the world, and it's from 5 to 10 million of uh, uh, carbon dioxide uh, tons coming from the textile industry every year. In the UK, 11 million uh, pieces of clothing are sent uh, to the dumpster. So um, clothes uh, are no longer a piece of desire and that now become a threat for the ecosystem. This fast fashion reminds me of Utopia, this uh, invisible city uh, by Italo Calvino, where uh, you know, its inhabitants were got tired of everything every day. So the Mercury, the, the, the god of change, asked them uh, promised them something new every day so they could have something to thrill them every day. Stefan, I'd like to ask you about something that Margarita has just referred to, and very rightly so. Transformation, not uh, the transformation of fashion, but of the fashion culture, because what is actually the purpose of fashion? What is it for? We we have all we I think we have all wondered about this lately because fashion not only I mean it does not only cover our skin and bones but also takes us somewhere else. It's a projection. It's an uh, it's an idea. It's a fantasy. Next week, uh, uh, the Milan Fashion Week will be held. As you know, some. Uh, um, shows will be held uh, in person, presentially. Some others will be held virtually. But what is it going to change in the fashion culture world? What can change? I really don't know. 
because we have a problem. I, uh, I've heard many colleagues who's, who are just wishing and hoping for things to go back to normal, to business as usual, and I think that's crazy. You know, uh, the past was very wrong, and we are now paying the price. So, what you know, this this uh, selfie phenomenon, that everybody wants to 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 show the stories on Instagram and show themselves with new items every day. For me, this is uh, this is not only crazy, but it's also very sad. People who only live through pictures and through their own selfies. Uh, to me, it's really painful to see, because fashion is wonderful if it's a game, if it's playful, if it's a pleasure. Now, the problem is that these large production chains that uh, sell everything very cheap, and as uh, Mar Margarita was saying, you know, uh, very right, rightly so, that, I mean, if it costs 29 euros, I mean, if a piece of clothing, if a garment costs 29 euros, that means that the production price is next to nothing. And you cannot be making people work in, in, in terrible conditions everywhere in the world. Why? Why? To make more, more garments that nobody wears or just wears once or twice. It's a shame. I have a problem with my dress. Uh, you know, some, some shops sell me, tell me, um, you know, the problem with your dress is that they last for a lifetime. And, you know, <laughs> that's what I want exactly. That's precisely what I want. I'm really concerned about those who say, I just hope that everything goes back to normal. I hope it does not. Well, not, it simply can't. I don't know whether you agree. Maybe you could, uh, I mean, why don't you share with us what you think about this? But in this, these last few months, don't you think that consumers today are more demanding that they think twice uh, or three times? Uh, whether they need, um, you know, something, the, whether that 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 shirt or that those trousers are, are actually, well, if there's a dramatic situation behind them, if there are women and children who have to to walk a long road back home from those factories that have been closed down in Mumbai, uh, they don't work, they don't eat, and they so. The outsourcing of fashion, and as his and this uh, offshoring of, of uh, production, has in a way given them work, but they don't. It does not let them live uh, a decent life. So now that there should be a new value coming into play, and it's something that very many uh, uh, fashion stakeholders have had to to. Uh, take into account, which is racism. Racism had to actually, uh, you know, take the blame and, uh, and admit it and confess to it. I mean, we did not take into account black models, black designers. Uh, we had not um, actually counted when on them. And uh, Condé Nast, for instance, this publishing house have been highly criticized because they were cri excluding diversity from the publication. So, um, um, Stefan, you had uh, very interesting experiences about this uh, on diversity, didn't you? Yes, to, for me this is quite difficult because I can't simply understand racism. I, I know, I, I'm aware that it exists, uh, increasingly so, but uh, uh, 20 years ago, I think, uh, uh, we had a new mayor in Milan who was uh, from the uh, very extreme right, very far right party, very racist. Everything was blamed on immigrants. No jobs, immigrants. No safety, immigrants had to, were to blame. And so I asked, asked a friend of mine, and I said, "Okay, I want, I want to have a fashion show, but what I want to have." Uh, my models need to be African, who are so elegant, naturally elegant, and all of the security guys, you know, people who you know are in charge of security. I need them to be black as well. So, Africans were everywhere, inside and outside. People told me, "Well, you're crazy. I mean, this is not going to work." I said, "No, because we live together." The 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 uh, um, you know this this uh, trend, tendency to use only the exotic exotic side of uh, Africans or Asians. Well, there's a cultural appropriation that is now in, on everyone's lips. Yes, 
Every time I'm inspired by any, by something, you know, after that fashion show, I went to, uh, on a journey to Senegal, and thanks to Senegal, uh, thanks to Africa, has uh, given me uh, so uh, have given me so many ideas. I mean, they they gifted me so many ideas. Well, well, they you could ask, you could say, okay, appropriation. Well, I mean, you're thieves. Well, that's the way it is. I think that uh, the idea is. Uh, Everybody is different. Uh, some people are whiter than others, but for me, this is this this doesn't really. I mean, you you cannot really understand this. I mean, now it's uh, it's the, the idea that now blacks are in fashion. Well, but now if the fashion trend goes away, what happens? I mean, I don't think that's uh, uh, that's acceptable either. And I'm, I'm very, I'm, uh, it's, it's, I think you're quite optimistic. I mean, your trust on consumers. I'm not so sure about this. Uh, I think you're far too optimistic. Well, uh, you know, this uh, fashion show you had with African models and African security guards in Milan, um, not to, to relate this to uh, any ethnicity or issues, but to try and find honesty through their personalities understanding beauty uh, as a as, um, diverse beauty, orthodox beauty. I think that the most important fashion editor in the world called you and told you that uh, your uh, fashion show did not have a point of view. Is it so? Well, no, 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 no. She, she came. She came there in person. I mean, she, she did not call me. She just was there. She is the most important, she is the most important woman in fashion. She came. Uh, she's lovely. She's 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 very nice to everyone. But then, but then, you know, she, but behind uh, my back, she she I know she said that I, that guy doesn't have a point of view. And so that's why I call her and ask her. What what is where were you sitting that you didn't see my point of view? I mean, you don't have a, because no, no, all women, not all women are dressed or uh, uh, in the, exactly the same. There are old women, young women, uh, um, shorter women, taller women, fatter women, slimmer women. And she said, oh, well, she, she just remained silent. And uh, then she just said, well, I don't have any more time for you. Time, time, time over. And then she hung up. So I thought, well, you may be, the, may well be the most important woman in fashion, but you don't know a thing. But I, I, I'm, I'm a, a really poor communicator. I, I know how to do things, but I, I do not. I, I'm not, I'm not one to to boast about myself. You didn't even understand why your your clothes had to have your own label, your name on the label. You don't even like labels. No, I don't like that. I don't like to 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 be wearing a brand. No, I'm wearing a dress. I'm wearing a a, a suit, a jacket, and that's that's my pleasure. I'm 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 living in Morocco uh, for a while, and uh, and it's quite funny because you see many many things that cost a huge amount of money. Uh, in the shops, but uh, then you can buy the, exactly the same things in the uh, Moroccan factories for five euros. So I really don't don't get it. Don't get this crazy numbers about uh, uh, brands. They are just that brands. In Es Fascinante, you have over 90 um, designers and uh, artisans, Spanish uh, um, artisans. So many. Uh, international um, companies, uh, very large ones like Avemarche, have used their own artisans, their own old, uh, craftsmen, craftsmen. And many, uh, Roberto Verino told me uh, once that, that in these last few months, and they, they, I mean, they, they, they were uh, overwhelmed with demand. Do you think that we've been uh, dumb? in Spain that we have not been able to make the best use of our own craftsmen. And yes, I think you're right. We have a very uh, varied uh, country with a very rich culture, very diverse. And uh, 
This is why we have very high capabilities to create and innovate. Uh, craftsmen have, you know, been creating shoes and uh, and uh, sandals and and mules and well, many of those. I mean, like uh, Jimmy Choo are made in uh, in Spain. Made Jimmy Choo shoes and yes, and Saint Laurent and uh, many of them are made in Ubrique. So, our job in my case is to group together designers who are older and some of them younger, with uh, not consolidated yet, and not only provide them with a uh, um, shopping platform, but also to, to support them throughout this process. So, our business sector in Spain is made up of many, very many uh, SMEs, micro companies in many cases. Some, uh, um, even it's only two people, couples who uh, try to distribute all the roles among the two because they have to do everything themselves. And it's very difficult to do everything well. So creators, what they love is doing the first part, I mean, creation, the original idea, the selection of fabrics, and then production. But then, where we come in, although we are increasingly involved in the first part of the process, we, we tell them what uh, garments could have, could be, uh, could be more successful, what lines could be uh, easier to sell, which uh, lines could be uh, um, uh, better uh, in general for them. But then, there is one part where, you know, that designers don't like really, which is communicating and selling their products, you know, marketing their products. And, and that's really hard for them. And that's where we help them out. Do you finance, do you fund uh, craftsmen yourselves so, so they can make their own uh, uh, products? And then you sell them. Well, we've been there only for a couple of years. We started in 2018. We started only with accessories at first because we thought that we would have less returns, uh, you know, and logistics-wise. So then we started to work uh, also with um, dressmakers and uh, and with design fashion uh, dress designers. Uh, that's more complicated sizes and. Uh, and you know returns and and product management is, is some of the um, uh, most difficult elements there i mean you have to accelerate things there so there is a good flow so we're now starting to make our own small um, production lines so we're now going to launch a small sports line sportswear sportswear line with a wonderful designer she she used to design for other sort of products and now we are starting to do this uh, with her and that's wonderful. Uh, I mean, they, they have the ideas themselves. They are very, uh, you know, they're geniuses, they're artists. We're working with artists. But, 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 but what they need us the most is in the second stage. Uh, marketing, uh, that size, no, this color will work, this will not work, this uh, making a good picture, making a, a good, uh, presentation like pampering the product I mean you have we have to really nurture the, the product uh, and actually give them make the most of it to, to like do uh, uh, st like styling pieces together and that is exactly what we do and the digital uh, part that's the future of retail I believe. Well, I think that Stefan is not so in so much agreement about the digitalization side, like the idea of uh, going into a shop, a workshop, and and and, and you know touching the fabric and trying the the garments on. About uh, online uh, commerce and online retail, you're worried about returns and sendbacks, you know. Well, it's true that, you know, you're right, uh, digital, the digital, the digital, the future is digital, there's no other way about it. To me, I mean, this is sad because I really like, you know, uh, you know, being doing things in person, but, you know, I, I come from an older time and I, I know that. But what I didn't like, I didn't used to like is in the digital world is those 
you know, others, uh, bored women, uh, bored men as well, who were just clicking on, clicking and clicking, and then buying things and then return them because they didn't like it. Well, I didn't like I, I, that's why I didn't like it, but now it's the only option for many shops to, to survive because now uh, when I go to work, because I go, you know, I take a stroll, in, in the shops, the shops themselves, they're empty in Milan. The fashion week starts uh, next Tuesday. And, well, I mean, we have like 30% of the buyers, uh, of the journalists that we, we, we used to, to have. So the cycle is over, uh, and I, I need to uh, understand it to do it the way I like it. Well, I don't agree that, you know, I'm not, I don't think that everything needs to be 100% digital, even in, not in literature or in fashion. Um, Stephen, you decided to abandon fashion shows and uh, leave that behind you. I don't know whether you missed them, but I think there was a sentence. Uh, you just said something that really touched me. You said, uh, these dresses seemed uh, like the, if they were sewn to the wind. Well, to me, Ludovica Ripa di Mare, it's, she's a model and she is a great poet, an Italian poet, and her husband is one of the greatest, is the greatest authority in the world about Dante. They are two wonderful. He uh, unfortunately he died, but she, she's she she is alive. Every time she comes, she comes and see one of my dresses. It's like if she, she was looking at a Christmas tree. She says, "Well, it's like it was dressed in the wind." And every time I look at her, I looked at her when I heard that, I started crying because I thought, you know, this was the greatest compliment she could have paid me. I mean, I love the wind, so something that seemed to be um, made in the wind, sawn in the wind. I mean, this this woman who's an intellectual, I mean, she's, she's not really uh, interested in fashion at all. She loves beautiful things, but for her, you know, uh, fashion for her is like going to Disneyland. So when she saw this and, oh, no, 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 that, that, that's what I wanted to say. And, and, it's, and I'm quite surprised that you actually know about this. I think that both of you are discussing something that's very interesting. It's the insignificance uh, on the one hand, and the, and, the, and to have um, the, the lack of meaning and the meaning, because fast fashion has uh, forced us to accumulate and, and pile up uh, clothes that have become insignificant, meaningless. You know, haute couture. You know, a dozen of petit mains of. Uh, uh, a craftsman uh, and craftswomen, artisans, uh, sewing and uh, looking always for the best material, the best fabric, working together with uh, other, uh, with milliners or with with uh, other old uh, uh, métiers d'art like uh, that were uh, actually had to be uh, recovered in France. Uh, uh, some uh, craftsmanships that were about to to be lost and forgotten and had to re be revived in France. I mean, this is so far away from fast fashion, but what is the value of, of uh, haute couture? What do you think? What is its value in the post, well, hopefully post-COVID era? Well, let me, let me be controversial. I think haute couture is uh, going to disappear. Um, this is a more egalitarian world, increasingly so, and people are no longer accepting and cannot afford uh, garments, uh, pieces of clothing that only have only been created for one moment, one person. Of course, there will always be artists and personalities, celebrities will need this singular, this very special moment, this unique uh, moment where the dresses are uh, even more important than at the moment of the person themselves are dresses that are remembered rather than the time or the moment of the person who wore them. So um, haute couture appeared at the same time as pret-a-porter, uh, casual um, wear. Then, uh, you know, there, there was the two lines, pret-a-porter, which was more of a luxury, and then uh, pret-a-porter that became 
uh, increasingly fast fashion in the 90s. So this pret a uh, th this casual wear that had become uh, fast fashion with this offshoring, uh, this generated a backlash to a new fast fashion that is a luxury pret a in a way to me, but with this added elements of sustainability, of responsibility, social responsibility, etc. But as for haute couture in, in the way, in the world that we are now living, it will be just a, a, a footnote, an anecdote. It will have an anecdotal value only. These. Uh, and this uh, catch, cat, uh, the catwalks, the fashion shows will only be exactly that, precisely that. Shows uh, will be, uh, it will be sh um, show value only. Even if 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 you have uh, one million viewers online, well, that's too ephemeral to to be anything else. Well, Stefan, you have uh, unique uh, pieces. Actually, what you have is an art couture uh, workshop. But no, this is this is because it's my pleasure. Because I l I love doing things uh, with my hands. I like to do the molding, the moulage myself. I I I really love doing those and meeting my my clients and doing that. But when I remember uh, when I started working for Yves Saint Laurent. Um, I've been, uh, I was uh, uh, his friend for a very, very many years. And when I said, I said, uh, well, um, I need to leave because I no longer like uh, haute couture. Pierre Berger told me, what are you, say, are you saying? And I said, well, uh, forget, for, forget, forget about duchesses or princess, princesses. I mean, these are, you know, uh, arms dealers, wives, and. Uh, uh, I really, I mean, that these are the ones who have the money. But Pierre Berger was uh, furious, absolutely furious. He didn't speak to me for a year because I left him. And there was Mrs. Khashoggi. Yeah, I remember. I remember there was a, a, a harem going down uh, the, from getting out of the car and, you know, with their sunglasses, black sunglasses and, uh, and covered in a veil. They, they were Khashoggi's wives. But, but what I, I really like fashion to, to do my own research, to do my own investigation. To, and then I sell things to shops. I, I sell to very, very few shops, only 15 shops, the only 15 shops in the world who don't care about my long-lasting dresses. Others, they say, well, I mean, what do you need to do to, to, to destroy one of your dresses? And I said, well, uh, I started. Uh, uh, in fashion when everything was black and everything was in black and now and then I moved on to colors and print uh, and in because uh, I said well if, if I'm all black I won't be seen so this is why it's all colorful and in print and now that everything is colorful and in print I, I am only dreaming about browns and grays well, let, uh, I've been told to read you uh, something, uh, some, some, something lines about uh, fashion. It's about Nicholas Coleridge. It's uh, the fashion conspiracy. It's a historical book, and there were some lines here speaking about the sense uh, or the meaning of um, haute couture. He said that it is uh, it could be compared to collecting watercolors and miniatures of Rayford. It, it is uh, something that comes out not from uh, the desire to purchase them, but uh, of a private enjoyment. And he uh, quotes Manolo Blanik. Manolo Blanik was saying, in New York, everything is so vulgar, so horrible, that women feel uh, compelled to, to pamper themselves with haute couture. They go back home. They uh, at, in the evening at nine, they, they look at themselves in the mirror, they, they caress themselves, the bodies, and say, well, I'm wearing a Saint Laurent. Well, I think this image, it comes very close to the truth. It is, goes beyond the, co the, the money, the price, and, and, and wealth, but they're still alone. Well, in my, in any, at any rate, this is my theory. Well, it's, to what extent do you think that fashion manages to project your identity forward. 
But for this to happen, you need to know yourself very well, I believe. I mean, not only physically, but also deeply, a deep emotional knowledge, because clothing can can make can reassure you completely, but it can also make you very insecure. You know, being well dressed gives you a new presence. It is a way to present yourself to the world. To it's a language in itself, and I think the um, importance it has. Uh, It, it comes precisely from that element in, in a, a very hedonistic society where we want to be as perfect as we can be, be uh, thin, be handsome, uh, no red, uh, do, do not have any uh, wrinkles. People are even, uh, I've been told that people are now spending much more uh, money in cosmetics than they are in dressing and themselves, but but fashion to me has a cultural value, um, and that's what it is of interest to me. To me, uh, fashion is a way to present uh, your country outside, abroad. I, I, I'm, I'm, I was very proud uh, to, to say, well, this was made in Spain and designed in Spain. This is Alessandro Cano, uh, and it's, uh, well, the, the I mean, the, the, the craftsman said he's not, he was not going to make any more because it was a t too complicated knitwork, uh, the knitting. Uh, it, but it, I'm, I'm really very happy wearing it because it represents my country. It's well thought, well designed. It's really be very becoming. And that's what I like to say about it. And that's because I think fashion is culture, and culture uh, highlights what we are. But you're, I mean, I, I absolutely agree. But what you say is completely contrary to something that Stefan just mentioned, which is the the culture of appearances and uh, the looks through, um, I mean, online, on social platforms, social media, we see that it's actually, we're not living um, uh, the, the present, we are showing the present to, I mean, it's we're showing ourselves. And he says, I mean, he's, he, Stefan says, uh, for him, this is dreadful. I mean, it's like being a voyeur, uh, it's voyeurism uh, that has invaded uh, society, we could say that. So, do you think that this fashion culture in which we believe is, uh, actually compatible with this uh, bubble uh, in which we, uh, this uh, bubble of vanities or appearances that we now live in. Well, I, I you know, I, I'd like to refer to what uh, Margarita just said, that she's happy to be wearing something Spanish. And I think that with all this um, pandemic happen, happening and going on, I think this is a very powerful thing. Because, I mean, the, the, the things, the sad things that are happening, people may forget the wonderful things that also happen in their countries. I remember at the beginning of the year, many uh, companies uh, were not saying that they were making things in China. And because if, you know, the final ironing of, of a garment is done in Italy, even if it, if everything else has been made in China, you can say it's been made in Italy. This is a shame. And so they didn't have any garments. They didn't have any clothes uh, to, to sell their clients because, I mean, they, they, were, they were stopped at the customs, at the borders. And so, um, but they couldn't say so to the customers. I mean, there, there are many shops that they are selling dresses for 8,000 uh, euros, it's 9,000 euros, and actually they were not made in Italy at all. They were made in China or worse. And they, they well, finally had to admit to that. And people realized, so I think that, of course, I mean, we are losing a lot of money. There's uh, millions of euros that are being lost every day, but it's a great thing to be showing that Spain is able to do this, France can do this, Italy can do this, and Morocco can do this, because almost, uh, and, you know, 40%, 50% of everything that you can find in the Moroccan market comes from China, and, and it was making uh, Moroccan uh, craftsmen disappear. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm sorry I've, I've, I've deviated from, from the issue, but I really wanted to mention this. Well, proximity commerce, I think it's one of the bases of fashion, of fast fashion. Atemporality, craftsmanship, uh, the, um, um, 
number of collections uh, has to be much lower every year because Chanel is, uh, you know, is producing about nine collections, up to nine collections a year. And we are promoting the idea of having one collection per year. But can they make a living out of that? Well, we want to have limited editions. We want not a, we want to six trousers, for instance, two uh, of uh, two um, pieces per size, SML, and that's it. But just you know, working with ten, twelve pieces, and then if we to begin with, and then if it sells, then adding more things to that. But always having something very timeless. Um, any designer who, who, who manages and succeeds in having you keep a piece of the clothing in your wardrobe that you always want to wear, that everybody remembers and that people say, oh, yes, you are the one who had that particular dress. Are you going to be wearing that dress? Well, I think that's a, the huge compliment. It's a dream to have the coat, the trousers, the two shirts. The, the 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 two shirts, two dresses, and one you know, I mean this the swimsuit you know that is exactly the swimsuit that you want to wear. I mean that is that is a tr something to be cherished and treasured. Well, yeah, um, but I'm a bit skeptical. Uh, in, the sign, in the sense that can we actually change the production paradigm because large companies, uh, large groups such as Gucci and designers who are now on the rise like Gabriela Hertz are already using the carbon neutral la label. But what? Are they uh, to Gucci's collections? Are, going to be, are they going to be, uh, it's going to be a smaller number every year? No. What they are doing is making millions and 18 millions to projects against uh, the deforestation of the Amazon or, for instance, symbolic gestures such as you know, models planting trees in the catwalk in a, in a Dior fashion show. But I, I think that's a bit of uh, makeup, you know, it's covering up. Yes, they, that's what it is, exactly. It's cosmetics. But, I mean, uh, at the bottom line is uh, the world is changing, uh, consumers are changing. I don't know what they will be doing about it because the number of products, the sheer number of products, because products need to be nurtured and pampered and, 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 and need to be told and need to be sold. And where, how are you be able to go into do this? I mean, I mean, they, they sell a lot because the main business, uh, the core business is cosmetics. I think that their haute couture collections may be, I mean, they probably are sold at a loss, probably, uh, you know, 20, 30, maybe sold a year pieces. But well, haute couture has always been, you know, in the realm of dreams. Yeah, creating trends, um, yes. But it's all sort of a small work of art. It has its own beauty in itself, and it was, you know, the 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 way to to sell perfumes and makeup. Yes, well, of course, that's what they live from. They cr create a trend. This major groups, that's what they they do. These major holdings. But now we are going towards uh, 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 designers having more time to think, more time to uh, look for materials, more time to design, um, having uh, uh, pieces that are much better actually made and crafted. Yes, and then we'll have more creators of bread a or casual wear who are now looking for new challenges. Now Tommy Hilfiger is creating uh, uh, clothes, clothes lines for uh, the um, uh, disabled, and they uh, have uh, committed themselves to mm, to have a jeans, to make jeans uh, that are not used in water in the production process and not contaminate, do not pollute uh, the environment. Well, you, we have five minutes, uh, four minutes actually, um, and I'd like you to split them between the two, and, and you could uh, just uh, give us some, some words of wisdom uh, to close up this. Uh, well, I really didn't want to finish. No. But it's true. The fashion industry is guilty. It's really guilty. They are to blame. 
of uh, you know overproduction is uh, there to yeah. I mean just a, a very simple economic calculation I I've chosen a fabric that is 25 uh, euros uh, worth uh, I only because I'm only buying you know 10 meters but if I'm a large group a large holding instead of 25 I'm it's going to cost me nine per meter if I make in a t-shirt then it's 60 euros to make it but if it's thousands of t-shirts they, they will say okay it's 12 euros so it's uh, economies of scale. I mean, so production is increasingly larger and prices are increasingly lower to make the most benefits and profits. And then you have those outlet shops. Uh, it's, you know, everything, uh, it's, it's um, to, to get up. And, and then Margarita, who comes from the financial world, she knows, she knows uh, how this works. I mean, that the, it's a, uh, the, the, the system killed itself. It, it drowned in its own. Uh, uh, the drowned, it drowned itself. It, asphy it was uh, asphyxiated. And I want to make him. Um, I make. Actually, want to to advocate for Spanish fashion, and I really. I think it's not been well treated in the media, and I'm really get very mad because in in uh, any fashion magazines here, yeah, well, all, all stories are about international fashion. I know that those who pay for them are the uh, large holdings, you know, the large fashion brands and cosmetics brands, but the uh, Spanish media mostly, in particular, should be much more focused in highlighting whatever, I mean, everything we have because we do. We have. We need to be more. Uh, we need um, to be more capitalized. That is true. But people are very serious about this. People are trained, well trained. They are very creative. They innovate. They, 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 they go outside. They see how things work in uh, London, in Paris, and Milan, and then come back here, and they love it. So I'm I'm actually I'm actually speaking here on in def in defense of uh, the Spanish fashion. There are many young people who are going to to make a lot of things, and they, we will hear about them a lot. We need to buy not much, but well. We need to think things very well. We have to need you need small wardrobes with full of interesting things, and we need to understand ourselves to buy things that actually suit us. Well, thank you so much. I think that both have managed to redefine what luxury is for us today. Luxury is not ostentatious. It's not to accumulate things, but it's uh, a feeling. It's a space. It's a, a recognition, a proximity, uh, raw materials, the love for raw materials, and uh, also uh, to be in search, uh, seeking uh, meaning. Let me finish with uh, uh, two lines from a book called Marcel Before Proust, uh, published by uh, um, an Argentinian publishing house. Well, he used to be, uh, Marcel Proust was to be a, a fashion uh, editor. He said, we need to triumph above banality, and that's the key. And well, thank you. Thank you ever so much. It's been a pleasure. Thank you all. Fenomenal. Muchas gracias. Gracias.